Amen. Well, it's good to be here with you today. Welcome, families, mothers. I pray you are celebrated today and have great fun. Do no cooking, no cleaning, no laundry. Amen, right? right. Kids, get to work. Yeah. Husbands, you know what to do. Let's go. So. One of the greatest gifts you can give a mother is a godly father and husband. It's true. And children, one of the greatest gifts you can give your mother is love and obedience and a helping hand and treating your siblings with love and peace and unity. Those are such great gifts. I come to you with this new series as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, and the, I'm just, I'm excited for this series because I know that if we can get back to the family blueprints that God has created and designed, it can revolutionize your home, our community, this church, and our world. And who knows, God may start right here in Dover, Delaware to bring a family revolution across our nation. Family entails a lot of things. So in this series, we're gonna talk about who to look for in someone, about having two godly people come together. So singles or those who are young adults or students, listen up, don't tune out. Come every week. Learn now the blueprints for a successful family, amen? amen. Maybe you're empty nesters and you're, I, I'm done. No, you're not, you're still grandparents, right? <laughs> but at the same time, we are also meant to be spiritual grandparents, spiritual mothers and fathers to those who don't have any. We're meant to be an influence still. We're a disciple-making church, meaning we should be equipped on all matters so we can help anyone in our community to know God and his family to know what it means to be a father or a mother, to teach from experience, even those times where we've failed ourselves, to teach from that too. This series is important because God says these things are important. God designed a family to care for his creation. It actually wasn't the church first, it wasn't the government, it wasn't a nonprofit organization. God established a family to care for his creation. Isn't that interesting? A family is the building block of society. As the family goes, everything else goes. We must care, so I don't care what age you are, what season of life you're in, a family either positively or negatively impacts our lives. And sometimes we're gonna have to step in and help other families, especially when they're asking for help, amen? That's why we need to tune in to this series. We're gonna to touch on who to look for in a spouse, raising kids, home life, being one in marriage, learning how God can heal or work through all situations, including broken homes. This could take us through the summer, who knows? There's a lot of things to talk about. I've written down seven messages so far of what I wanna cover, but eventually I want my mom and dad to come up here and share how they came from broken homes and yet God has made everything and redeemed everything for his good. Amen, so it's possible. So this isn't about you know just the perfect family, okay? This isn't about that. In fact, next week we're gonna talk about how there is no perfect family because of what happened in the garden but we still need God's help. Today, I wanna to start with something very basic and fundamental. Today's message could be so far removed from society that we don't even think this is true, but it is. And I wanna share how the family began and what our purpose was and still is. I wanna focus on God's original design for family. And again, we have, in our culture, have gotten so far removed from that that I actually have to be very basic and fundamental today so that we all understand what God intended for family. So let's go to Genesis 1 because the word is our guide on all things family, amen? amen? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, 
This is the sixth day. He saved the best for last. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Hmm. To be like us, plural. The Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, were there in the beginning of time, creating all things. And we are to be in their image. And he says this about human beings, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Sorry about that, but they are out there. (laughs) I've been dealing one in my backyard, and I'm trying to find it. (laughs) So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. That means that every single one of you have the fingerprint of God upon you. You are image bearers of God. You are a resemblance, a reflection of who God is. We'll keep going. It says, in the image of God, he created them. He gets specific. Male and female, he created them. God was clear on gender. There's male and there's female. And there's a good reason for it. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. In other words, have kids. Praise the Lord. All the tired moms are like, praise the Lord. Yeah. Us dads too. (laughs) Fill the earth and govern it. Hmm. Rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the grounds. I like what Andrew Murray says in his book, How to Raise Children for Christ. He says, God's purpose in the creation of man was to make known to the universe his own unseen glory and perfection. In other words, We can see God because God's handiwork is all over you. But not just that you are created in his image, but you also are to reflect his characteristics and qualities. He goes on to say this, man was not only to have single points of resemblance to God, but in all he was and did upon earth, he was also to prove that he was indeed created in God's image and after his likeness. We are image bearers of God, in other words, created to embody and resemble God's characteristics such as faithfulness, devotion, love, and truth, because God does not lie. We're created to reflect, to rule, and to care for all creation just as God does. In fact, your innate desire to care or to protect, to nurture, comes from God and who he is, and now you've inherited that and received that. Let's go to Genesis 2, verse 18. He gets a little more specific here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Oh, is that true or what? Oh, my goodness. There's plenty of videos out there that man's lifespan is much shorter than woman's. We need women to keep us in check. We need women to help us. We couldn't do all the work that God had for us without our helpmate, our partner in life. So thank the Lord for that. Says this, I will make a helper who is just right for him. This is interesting though, because now it goes into animals. Okay, like like first, it was gonna be possibly an animal that helps Adam. Okay, it says this, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he could call them and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him, not even man's best friend. Wasn't enough help. That's a dog just in case you didn't. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. We seem to do that pretty well too, don't we? We sleep through everything. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs 
and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. Notice that God brought her to the man. So God brings man and woman together and it says, at last, the man exclaimed, ah, thank you, God. There's a suitable helper. This one actually can talk to me. This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. I heard one pastor say when he saw Eve, he said, whoa, man. She, <laughs> whoa, man, whoa, man. She's pretty. Whoa. That was funny. This explains. Okay, so you have man and woman. God brings the woman to the man or... Okay, in this moment, and this explains why a man leaves his father and mother, and just so you know, that's mankind, so ladies, you would also leave your father and mother to be one in marriage, okay? So this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, and then it says in last verse, now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame because they had not sinned yet, so they had no idea that they were naked. This explains, let me say this again, why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. My friends, this is the first family, this is the original design that God had for the family. Let me explain in detail just to help um, just all of us to make sure we're on the same page. After God placed Adam in the garden, he saw it was not good for him to be alone. God is a triune God, one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's a relational God. And if we have his image and if we are like him, then we're relational people too. Adam was alone. God saw that it wasn't good, so he created Eve to help him to have companionship because the animals weren't cutting it. Simple as that. And she was the perfect helpmate. The first man and woman came together in marriage to form a fellowship that would fulfill the vision of God's creation and reflects the relational God who made us. Marriage, what we see here and what Jesus says in the New Testament is always this, between a man and a woman. Amen. Simple as that. Amen. Amen. The man and the woman would leave the authority of their parents and cleave to each other, becoming one flesh. You can remember that by leave, cleave, and weave. God's unique design of male and female, man and woman, united in marriage, made his vision for fruitfulness and multiplication possible. Anything different than God's design and humanity would cease to exist, let alone multiply. What am I talking about here? Parents, if you haven't taught your kids, about sexual reproduction, this might start that conversation today. <laughs> Someone just said, oh Lord. Okay. <laughs> this is part of life. And if I don't teach first or you don't, the world will teach instead, just so you know. The gift of sexual reproduction between a married man and a woman, notice I said married man. Sex is supposed to be shared within the confines of marriage. The reason why is because the results of having sex is supposed to be to have children and to be married helps to have commitment and security and confidence that you'll be together forever. It's the way it's supposed to be. And then you can raise those children together and there'll be peace and security and confidence that together you will raise the children. Outside of marriage, there's no commitment if you're having sexual interactions together or relations, there's no reason for the man to commit to you, woman. Woman, there's no reason for you to commit to them because you have not married. This is why God designed for this to happen within the, the confines of marriage, the context of marriage. So why? Because we're meant to be fruitful and multiply on this earth. We're meant to continue to spread the kingdom of God and have little children that also look like the kingdom of God, that look like God and his attributes. The womb of a pregnant woman is undoubtedly a work of art from the mind and hands of God, isn't it? I am still baffled, I am amazed at what God can do in nine months. It's incredible. 
As a father, I sat there and watched my children be brought into this earth with my, my mouth just down to the ground. <laughs> Couldn't believe what God has created to happen in a mother's womb. Women, you are incredible gifts to society. Thank you. There being no source of food for a newborn on earth, the woman, the wife, now mother, has become the source of nutrition for her child. Man, we're incapable of feeding our kids, our babies. We need, this sounds elementary, I know, but this has to be explained in our culture today. It requires a woman to help nurture a newborn baby. Once again, the woman, the female, the wife, and the mother is essential to God's vision for society. And then there's the parenting. <laughs> the fun begins. The parents hold, nurture, protect, feed, love, and care for the child. The child grows up in this environment of one flesh, of one couple, one team, who give their all to this child. And before there was a church, there was the family. And it was the responsibility of godly parents to raise a godly family. It is in these homes where the faith and trust in God, the love of God, and the truth of God would be transferred and passed down. Godly homes would follow God's laws to formulate the principles and convictions that each child would live by. I like what uh, one author says here, the family is God's basic building block with which he builds nations. Governments, churches, business enterprises, charitable institutions, etc. The centrality of the family lies in its unique nature and function. Nothing can replace the family. In his infinite wisdom, God created the family. It is not a man made institution. Anyone who ignores, bypasses, or tries to reconstruct it rejects God's plans, and those who try to replace it will fail. To fight the family is to do battle against God himself and rebellion against God always leads to death for cultures as well as individuals. Whole cultures perish when they ignore or tamper with God's design for life. Amen. That was George Scipioni in his book, The Battle for the Biblical Family. What's the purpose of godly families? George also says this, God's word defines the family as well as declaring its purpose. The family is a man and a woman in lifelong covenantal companionship serving God. Notice serving God by taking dominion over creation. Under his guidance and in, in fellowship with him, they seek to be fruitful, to fill the earth, to subdue it and to rule over it for God's glory. So we're meant to serve God in our marriages by also loving and serving our spouses. We're meant to serve God by raising up disciples, by raising up children of God that would reflect the nature and the characteristics and the qualities of God. And we are the examples for our children on how to be married, how to raise kids in the Lord, how to worship God, how to take care of our homes, take care of our, life, our lifestyles, our livelihood. We are examples for our kids and all, and all of that, we're supposed to have God in the middle of all of our decisions so that they grow up and it's a perpetual, continual, just multiplication of God's glory spreading throughout the world. Simply put, we are meant to be in fellowship with God so we can be a godly person in a godly marriage raising a godly family to bring forth God into our world. What I'm trying to say here today is the vision God had was more than about us and our own pleasure or enjoyment. This is what I mean by this might be foreign to us. This is foreign to our society. Isn't, isn't relationships all about us so we can get whatever we want to make us happy? That's actually not what God intended. Will we be happy when we do it the way God wants? Yes. Oh, it's incredible. To be able to be in a relationship that honors God at the same time and then to get married and then to have children and do it God's way, do it by his design, oh, it's a blessing that will be for generations and generations to come. 
To be honest with you, I'd rather have more security and be more obedient and faithful to God's plan than me have fun and be happy because it's gonna benefit my kids one day that I pass down a spiritual inheritance that will last forever instead of just fun. By the way, yeah, let me explain that too. I'm gonna be really blunt. The world says sex is fun. Well, it is, but it's safe in marriage. And when we do it outside of marriage, now we cause havoc upon people's hearts, brokenness in people's hearts, women, men, and then we have children born out of wedlock without security, without a family, or we abort in our society. We're damaging kids' lives because we're not doing it God's way. It's not about fun. It's not about being happy. It's about being holy in God's eyes. It's about doing it his way. Amen. The vision for God's original design for the family shapes how we view and enter relationships. So listen to me, students, young people. When you realize that the purpose for family, for relationship, is to bring God glory and to help him expand his kingdom on earth, and what I mean is a kingdom of love, a kingdom of faithfulness, a kingdom of honesty and truth, power, eternity, That's the kind of kingdom you get to be a part of as children of God. And when you get into a relationship, that is the reason why. It's not just for you to have fun. Although having a relationship brings a lot of life to you, but it's also supposed to bring life to them. I'll get into this, okay? But for now, just know this, that we should not enter relationships, and especially marriage, or have sex with another person, without thinking what could be the consequences or implications for those things. That we should remember that these are sacred gifts, that God instituted marriage and family and gave us the gift of sexual reproduction, not just for our pleasure, but for his pleasure, his glory, to bring the kingdom about the earth, to spread his goodness so that people won't go to hell and they'll know the way to eternal life. Yes, that is the reason why. And what's amazing is in marriage, all those things, you will have peace, you won't have anxiety over it, you'll have confidence, you'll have love, you'll enjoy even more because you did it God's way. In other words, what am I trying to say? Just like in marriage, and I do the wedding vows, I, I tell the couple at the altar, the day they're saying yes, or I do, I say we don't enter into this lightly or unadvisedly, but with great fear and respect for why God created relationships. When we come to this altar, you have already realized that and you're not entering into this union lightly. Well, don't enter into a relationship lightly. Make sure the person you are talking to also cares about what God wants to do through their lives and their family. Again, I'm jumping ahead, but it needs to be said today. Let me tell you what the world says in one aspect, and I was actually encouraged by this. This was at a hearing of the UN for an economical and social forum. This is about 10 years ago. So I don't think the UN or our governments have taken this advice because it hasn't really been getting better. But this is what they said. And this is from International Federation for Family Development. This forum was about social economical uh, progress, trying to help our world grow and be strong and be able to handle the population, be able to handle people's livelihoods. And this is what they said about the family. Taking into account the broad experience of our federation in dealing with families worldwide, We see every day that family is where the vast majority of people learn the fundamental skills for life, and other institutions confirm this. At the the most fundamental level, family structure and family process matters. Evidence shows that outcomes for both children and adults are not equal regardless of family background, and public policy should reflect this. Children growing up in healthy, married, two-parent families are more likely to lead happy, healthy, and successful lives than those who have not experienced the same level of family, security, and stability. 
Those who build stable families have a higher life expectancy, lower risk of mental illness, alcoholism, and domestic violence. The children show lower infant mortality rate, lower risk drug addiction, and lower incidences of engaging in criminal activities after puberty, higher academic achievements, lower incidence of mental illness, and fewer teenage unwanted pregnancies. A stable family is the lowest cost option for both its members and the state. Furthermore, members of stable families are more disciplined when it comes to fulfilling legal and social norms, contributing towards financing social security. And this is, this is from a non-Christian, non-biblical organization. Families need to be helped if they are to fulfill their irreplaceable social role. The family is irreplaceable. Now, God's family is essential and should not be tampered with. Because if you have a healthy family, praise the Lord, but we need holy families too. We need families that are in fellowship with God and raise up kids who want to do what God wants them to do. And that will be a blessing upon all of us. It would bring joy, peace, unity. In other words, it would bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. The necessity of a godly family is, goes without question. As Christians, we know this. The world doesn't hold to the conviction that God's design for family is essential to the well-being and peace of our society. Our nation is pushing God out of the, the remedies, and we're coming up with man-made remedies that are only band-aids over gashing wounds that are affecting our families. I'm not running for office, just so you know. <laughs> But I have to tell you, I get really bothered when I see that all of our answers for brokenness in families is money. No, it's not money, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Amen. Government programs have a place. Money has a place. But nothing is more important than Jesus and I'm asking us to not point fingers so much at the world, but to look at us. To look in the mirror, because we know that a godless nation isn't gonna do godly things. That's insane. For us to think that godless people would do godly things is ridiculous. They're, they don't serve God, they don't read his word, they don't wanna live by it. They might say they do, but it doesn't mean they do. So we can't expect the world to change the world. The only thing that can change the world is Jesus Christ working through his church and it starts in our own hearts and in our own homes to change the communities that we live in. We need to keep in mind that before there was a church or a government, there were families. It was actually godly families that started governments. Someone shocked by that? <laughs> it's actually very simple biblically. When we see in scripture in the Old Testament is that God had Moses and others appoint men over matters to deal with civic matters in community. That was the first government. These men acted as judges to help Moses. When, when Israel was overthrown, God appoints Joseph to take care of his family, his people, to help uh, save them, to help continue the remnant, to continue his promise that he would make them a great nation. So he helps Joseph elevate into a government position. When we were completely ransacked by Babylonians because of our sin as godly people, Daniel was put into leadership uh, position. He was in politics. And God used Daniel to influence the kings so that we could still survive and live and worship our God. We need godly civic leaders, but it begins in your home, my friends. It begins in our homes that we live godly lives. It starts with us, church, because we know better. Because we know the word. The world doesn't know the word. Very good. <laughs> so, 
We see the necessity of a godly family. Here's, here's what's actually happening though. And just so you know, God didn't make a mistake when he made the family, okay? His design for the family is flawless, but our execution and stewardship, unfortunately, are not flawless. And we're gonna hear more about that next week because something happened in the garden that messed everything up. But God knows how to fix things. He knows how to redeem, he knows how to restore, he knows how to heal. God's love, God's salvation, God's truth, eternal life is spreading throughout America. Don't get it twisted. We see a lot of bad things happening, but God is still on the throne and God is still spreading throughout our nation. Amen. And it's happening through families. A father and a mother, and sometimes just a father because of unfortunate reasons, or sometimes it's just a mother. And God fills in the gaps and still helps us raise our children to do godly things. Okay? God can be, he can be the one that fills in. If you're in a broken home, it's okay. God is still there. God is not done with your kids. He's not done with you. He's not done with your family. God will fill in the gaps. Okay? But here's reality. God is spreading, but it, he's working, but he's moving through the family. He's moving through the churches, and he's going to move into the public sector. God is working. People are coming to Jesus all the time here. Praise the Lord. We're going to keep leading people to Jesus. We're going to keep doing water baptisms because Jesus is bringing in the harvest. What I'm asking us to do as a church is to lock into this series. Come to this series. It may take us through the summer. I get it. We're going to travel. We're going to go on vacation. So am I. I got a trip I need to go on to for ministry, all those things. But let's lock in. And when I'm gone, I'm asking my parents to share how they came from brokenness and other issues in their family, and God still used them. God used them to salvage things. God used the moms or the dads. God used their parents, okay, to help form a family. And now I'm a bene beneficiary of that. I am reaping the benefits of my parents sowing righteousness in my home. And now there's a righteousness coming forward. Amen. But newsflash, uh, my parents aren't perfect. I think they want me to say that real quick. I'm not perfect. My family's not perfect. My wife and kids can tell you that. The only way that we can do this life is if Jesus is at the center of our families. Mothers, fathers, Jesus has to be at the center of your heart. Look, I mean, here's a salvation call. Here's a reason why you should believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because apart from him, you can do nothing according to John 15. You want to be a loving father or a loving mother? You need the love of God without any barriers in the way. You're going to need Jesus. We need Jesus. We all do. Not just for our families, but for our own destiny, our own eternity. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? We're just getting started on this series. I look forward to continue next week. Things get a little messy in the first family. We're going to read about that and talk about it. But God is good. And all the time, that is good. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for your design. Thank you for your purpose for the family. And Lord, the relationships, the marriage, the kids, it's all, it's all a blast. It's fun. Everything in between, Lord. In your context, in your boundaries that you've set up, it is meant to bring us so much joy and so much life. And God, I pray none of us leave here thinking anything different because it is incredible to be in a godly family doing life your way. God, I pray that we would take this series seriously. Lord, that we would look at our relationship with you and our relationship with others, examine them according to your word, and Lord, help us to live as the family you intended. Lord, we pray for our world and us. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for the ways that we have conducted ourselves. 
We ask God for another chance to change. We ask, Lord, this for mothers, for fathers, for kids, for grandparents. God, give us another chance today. We're still breathing. We still have oxygen in our lungs. We can start over today and be a better father, better mother, better kids, better family. God, teach us through your word. Help us to do it your way, not our own. God, I pray that we would decrease and you would increase. And Lord, today, I pray for those who have wandered away from their creator, who is you, God, and they're feeling lost because they don't know why they're here or what they're doing. They don't know their place in this world, and that's because they've been far from you. None of us know why we're here if we're far from our creator. God, I thank you that through Jesus Christ, you called us back home. That even while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us so that we could come home and find out the door is open. But Lord, today I pray that just as the prodigal son realized he needs to come home, realized that he was a fool for running away, realizing that his sin was foolishness, his selfishness was foolishness, and that he wanted to be with God, he wanted to be with his father, he wanted to be home. God, I pray today that you would draw whoever it may be in this room or online, that you would draw them home. And may they know that you, Lord, are a loving father with your arms open wide, waiting, watching on the horizon for, you to, for them to come back. God, I pray, Lord, today that they would realize their sin, Lord, and ask for forgiveness of their sin. And thank you, Jesus, you have forgiven us. Your cross is enough. One time, did it all. Today, we receive that forgiveness. We thank you for your forgiveness. And now we wanna be in relationship and fellowship with you. We want you to be our Lord and our Father. So Lord, I pray that whoever it may be in this room, that they would pray this today, that they would give their life to you. And thank you, God, for welcoming them home, and we will too. We love you, Lord. Help us to live out this life that you've called us to live. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our mothers. What a gift. May they be blessed today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God glory and praise. We thank you, Lord. 